Hello, this is Weiwen Chow, and this is Intellectual Property, Part C. In this part, we will look at copyright infringement, the Creative Commons, and the fair dealing exemption to copyright. A copyright infringement occurs when all or a substantial part of a copyright work is used without authorization or without a license. If you remember a number of modules ago when we were, when we were covering contract law, in, in one of those modules, uh, the lecture videos included a little snippet of your favorite song, Justin Bieber's uh, Baby. So that, that, that little snippet was only for about 10 or so seconds. So that was not all or substantial part of that song. So because it was, it was only a small snippet, it was not considered copyright infringement. Now, if you, if you are, uh, if you do commit copyright infringement, let's say you illegally download a, a thousand songs, um, then there, the, the amount of damages that you could be made liable for are, are specifically set by the Copyright Act. And, and it depends on whether or not uh, the infringement was done for a commercial purpose or a non-commercial purpose. So if it's just you downloading songs for your own personal enjoyment, that's non-commercial use. The, the, the statutory damages that you could be made liable for would be a minimum of $100 and a maximum of $5,000. So that's for all the infringements in a single proceeding. So that means that if you're sued for copyright infringement uh, for uh, those thousand uh, illegally downloaded songs, so that's in one single proceeding. Uh, so even though it's 1,000 different downloads, or, or in other words, 1,000 different copyright infringements, the, the most that you can be made liable for is the $5,000. It's not $5,000 $5, per song, it's $5,000 per legal proceeding. Now, if you were... If you legally downloaded those songs for commercial purposes, in other words, you were, you were selling, uh, re reselling copies to other, other people, or you were using, if you're a DJ, you were using that music uh, in, 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 in doing your work as a DJ, that's commercial use. And the, the, the maximum penalty then would be uh, $20,000 per work infringed. So that could be $20,000 per illegally downloaded song. There are other uh, ways of infringing copyright that are uh, in the Copyright Act. If you break a digital lock, or uh, the technical word or, or technical uh, acronym is TPM, Technological Protection Measure. If you break a digital lock, um, then that that is considered copyright infringement. So I think it used to be that when you downloaded songs off of iTunes, you could not. It, you could not uh, convert it into some other format like MP, MP3 that you could play on another on a different non-Apple device. Now, if you were uh, able to hack it and break that digital lock to put it into a different format, that would be considered copyright infringement. Uh, in terms of file sharing uh, sites uh, and uh, and 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 your ISPs, they could also be made liable for copyright infringement, but only if they intentionally or knowingly allowed users to illegally access copyright material. So there has to be some intention or knowledge of the uh, illegal uh, copywriting uh, or legal uh, uh, copying of material before there's liability on these, on these sites or your ISP. Let's say you like to legally download movies using using BitTorrent. Under the Canadian Copyright Act, what 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 may happen is that the the copyright owner, so in this case it would be the 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 movie company that owns the copyright uh, for the movies that you illegally downloaded, you know, they, they have technological ways of finding out uh, the IP addresses of the people who are illegally downloading their movies. With those IP addresses, they can figure out who your internet service provider is, who your ISP is. 
Under Canadian, Canadian copyright law, that copyright owner can send a notice to your ISP uh, advising them of the, of the copyright infringement, and then the ISP has an obligation to forward that notice uh, to, to, you, the, the, to you, the customer. Now, the ISP has no obligation to disclose your name to the, to the copyright owner. So all the copyright owner really knows is your, is your IP address. So the, the ISP forwards that copyright notice to, to you, and, and that notice often includes uh, a demand for some kind of settlement payment, and and all bunch of threats uh, to 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 sue you for for copyright infringement. So here's a a a sample uh, letter that a copyright uh, owner uh, would send, and then your ISP would would forward uh, would forward to you. So in this letter, uh, it explains that the ISP is forwarding to you this notice, and and that your ISP account. Uh, has been used to to download uh, uh, copyright content, which infringe, infringes the rights of of the copyright owner. And in this particular letter, it it says that you could be liable for up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars per infringement in civil penalties, which is blatantly untrue under Canadian copyright law. We just mentioned earlier that for a non for non commercial copyright infringement. The most that you can be liable for is a maximum of five thousand five thousand dollars. So, and in this letter, they also uh, kindly offer to, uh, to to settle it uh, uh, with you, um, and they give you a link that you can click on and make an online payment, uh, and 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 they won't. They promise not to sue you sue you by giving you a legal release if you pay twenty dollars per. Per infringement, so if you illegally downloaded 100 files, uh, you would be you would be paying uh, two thousand two thousand dollars. And and after that offer to to settle, they 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 they're very clear, or or they 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 make a very clear threat that they will sue you, or or or, or literally they say they will pursue every available remedy. Uh, against you, including claiming uh, recovery of attorney's fees and and costs if if you don't uh, agree to to make that settlement uh, settlement payment. Now, if you if you receive a notice uh, like that, or if you know a friend who might receive a notice like that, uh, what what should you do? Is is the big question. Uh, I'm not going to provide you with any legal advice on what you should do, uh, but what you can do is is read this uh, uh, blog post by Michael Geist, who's one of the legal leading legal uh, experts on uh, on on technology law, and you can find his article at that link. An alternative to the restrictions on use placed by copyright is is the uh, the Creative Commons. What the Creative Commons uh, is is an alternative way of allowing creators to to share their works uh, without without charging fees or or royalties. So there are a number of different Creative Commons licenses uh, that uh, that can be that can be used. Uh, th these are just six of them. These are not uh, all of the available uh, Creative Commons licenses. On on the one one extreme is the the CC zero. License, which is uh, a public domain, that means anyone can use it without paying a royalty. They can do whatever they want with it. They can use it for a commercial purpose or, 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 or non-commercial purpose. Um, there are there are many different combinations of permutations that you can have uh, with a Creative Commons license. You can restrict the use uh, to only, let's say, non non-commercial use, uh, and and you can also require that the that the author. Uh, of the work be be attributed whenever the work is is used by by someone else. Um, you can also uh, have the license uh, allow uh, allow someone else to to modify the work uh, 
uh, as well. So there are there are many different uh, ways of of designing a Creative Commons license as a way of of sharing uh, something that you've created without uh, without charging any royalties. The concept of fair dealing is used to help strike that important balance in intellectual property law between individual benefits and societal benefits. Fair dealing is an exemption to copyright, which allows people to use copyrighted materials without having to pay uh, any royalties. Now, that use has to be for some specific purposes that are beneficial to society. There is a two-step test that is applied to qualify for fair dealing. This two-step test comes from the Supreme Court of Canada decision in CCH Canadian and the Law Society of Upper Canada, which we'll look at in more detail on the next slide. This two-step test, uh, first, the first step is we look at the purpose of of the use of the copyrighted material. There are some specific purposes that are set out in the Copyright Act which qualify for fair dealing. Those purposes are private study, research, criticism, review, news reporting, education, parody, or satire. Uh, so what the Copyright Act is essentially saying is that uh, if if copyrighted material is used for any of those purposes, those purposes are are viewed as being generally beneficial for our society and therefore should not be constrained by copyright. So that's only the first step. It has to be one of those purposes. The second step is, even if it qualifies for one of those purposes, the, the, the use or the dealing has to be considered fair. So to determine fairness, we look at a number of different factors that the Supreme Court has set out. The purpose of the dealing, the character, the amount of the dealing, how much of the material are you are you copying. Uh, and so we look at usually a, a percentage of what the whole amount of the work is. The availability of alternatives to copying, the nature of the work, and the effect of the dealing on the work. Let's now look in detail at the CCH and Law Society case. So this is the case in which the Supreme Court sets out the legal test for fair dealing. This case involves the Law Society of Upper Canada, which is the, the body which governs the legal profession uh, in Ontario. The Law Society maintains and operates a, a reference and research library called the Great Library at Osgoode Hall in downtown Toronto. One of the services that the Great Library provides is called a custom photocopy service. So what that uh, service does is that if you're a Law Society member, let's say you're a, you're a lawyer, no matter where, where you're located uh, in Ontario, you can contact one of the librarians at the Great Library and they can, they can look up something for you. Let's say it's a case or a specific article and they can photocopy that case or article and, and send it to you uh, and they can either deliver it in person, presumably if you're in the Toronto area or downtown area, or they can send it by mail or send it, or send it by fax. The various publishers that, uh, that the library uh, has uh, materials from, uh, including uh, CCH Canadian, uh, had some serious objections to this, to this service. They, they took the position uh, that this service comp uh, constituted copyright infringement. So they sued uh, the Law Society uh, for copyright infringement. One of the legal issues that the Supreme Court considered in this case was whether the Law Society's dealings with the publisher's works were considered to be fair dealing under the Copyright Act. In, in setting out the applicable law here, the, the Supreme Court first stated that the fair dealing exception is a user's right and that in order to maintain the proper balance between the rights of a copyright owner and user's interests, that, that fair dealing exception should not be interpreted restrictively. Then the court, more specifically, you know, set out the test that we've already 
uh, uh, explained in the previous slide, where uh, to, to have fair dealing, the first step is to look at the purpose of, of the dealing. Does it qualify for one of the purposes of research, private study, criticism, review, news reporting, education, parody, or satire? And then the second step is consider is to determine whether or not that dealing is fair. And then the court set out the, the six different factors in assessing whether a dealing is fair. The court then explained how these different factors are applied or, or what they mean. The first factor in determining fairness is the purpose of the dealing. So the purpose goes back to the purposes that are set out for fair dealing under the Copyright Act, which are namely research, private study, criticism, review, or news reporting. So, so those were the purposes that were set out in the Copyright Act at the time of this case. Subsequently and more recently, there, there, are, there have been a few additional fair dealing purposes added to the Copyright Act, uh, which are education, parody, or, or satire. But the court also provides a, a bit more color in terms of uh, applying this factor of purpose of the dealing. So they made other comments such as, you know, if research is done for commercial purposes, it may not be as fair as research done for charitable purposes. The, the second factor in determining fairness of the dealing is the character of, of the dealing. So the court pointed out here that if, let's say, multiple copies of works are, are made and they are widely distributed, this, that would likely be unfair. So in contrast, if a single copy of work is used for a specific legitimate purpose, then that's likely to be to be fair to be fair fair dealing and if the copy of the work is destroyed after it's used for its intended purpose that also may help lead to a finding of of fairness and in some instances looking at the custom or practice in a particular trade and industry may help to determine whether or not the dealing is fair The, the third factor uh, looks at the the amount of of the dealing. Uh, so uh, so usually one rule of thumb that people apply uh, is the ten percent rule. Is that if if you are copying less than ten percent of a of a book, let's say, that usually would qualify for for fair dealing. So uh, the Supreme Court here says that. If the amount taken from a work is is trivial, then then it's likely to be fair fair dealing. But the, but the court also says that in some situations, uh, it, it it may be fair to to copy one hundred percent of of a work. Uh, one example is if you are uh, if you are writing an article to criticize or review. Uh, a, a a photograph, uh, you, know, you would in, in you would be able to fairly reproduce one hundred percent of the photograph uh, in in your in your review, and that and that would likely be considered fair. Alternatives to the dealing uh, looks at you know whether or not there is a non copyrighted equivalent of the work that could have been used instead. Of the of of the of the copyrighted work, the fifth factor looks at looks at the nature uh, of the work. So that can be a number of different things. Um, some of the uh, possibilities that the court uh, commented on uh, were if if a, if a work has not been published, uh, the dealing may be considered fair in that. You know the, the 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 reproduction could lead to a wider public dissemination of the work. Uh, in contrast, if the work is considered to be confidential, then 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 copying the work in terms of the dealing uh, could could be considered to be unfair. 
The sixth and last factor is the effect of the dealing on the work. What specifically this looks at is the effect of the dealing on the market for the copyrighted work. In other words, will that copying uh, take away sales of the uh, legitimate sales of the copyrighted work? So when the court applied that law uh, to the facts, they, they, they applied all, all five uh, factors to determine uh, fairness. But they, but they first dealt with the first step of determining whether or not the purpose of the dealing fell within one of the purposes that are set out in the Copyright Act. And they concluded that the purpose here was, was, for, was for research. And that and that research should be interpreted uh, in a in a liberal and broad uh, fashion, so as not to unduly constrain uh, users users' rights. So specifically, they said that you know, research for the purpose of advising clients, giving opinions, arguing cases, preparing briefs, briefs factums, uh, is nonetheless research, and it doesn't matter that lawyers are carrying on the business of law for profit for, for profit in the conduct of that research. So then the court moved on to the second step of the analysis in determining whether or not the dealing was fair by applying the, the six different factors. In finding that the Law Society's dealing was fair, the court focused on the facts that, uh, the, that, the, uh, that the access policy that the Law Society uh, operated under in providing this uh, service uh, states that not all requests for for copying or for access to materials uh, will be honored and that if a request, request does not appear to be for the purpose of research, criticism, review, or private study, a copy uh, will not will not be made. Um, and and that, uh, th that also that this access policy limits the amount of the work that will be copied and, and that if, if the, the request exceeds what might typically be considered reasonable, then the, the librarian has the right to refuse to, to fulfill a, a request made by a law society member. The Supreme Court decision in CCH was in 2002. Since then, the Supreme Court of Canada has reaffirmed its broad interpretation of fair dealing as set out in that CCH case. It, in July 2012, the court released five decisions which set out, a, again, a broad interpretation of fair, of fair dealing. That, that series of five decisions is called the copyright pentology. Uh, in, in one of those decisions uh, called SOCAN and Bell Canada, the court said that the purpose of research, which is one of the purposes uh, that are allowed for fair dealing, should be interpreted broadly from the perspective of the user, not the service provider. So this case involved an online music provider providing subscribers with 30 to 90 second previews of copyright songs on its website. And the court held that those previews are not copyright infringement since they are protected by fair dealing. In another one of those cases in the copyright pentology, uh, this one called Alberta Education and Access Copyright, the court, the court indicated that, that the purpose of research, which is another uh, fair dealing purpose, is not limited to a scholarly inquiry, but can include lifelong learning and daily information seeking. So you don't have to be a student or a scholar to, to engage in research. It can be a part of anyone's everyday, everyday life. And also, private study uh, does not require isolation or solitude, but can occur in a classroom or as a group activity. Uh, this case involved teachers uh, reproducing excerpts from textbooks and giving those excerpts to their students for classroom studies. And the court held that that, that, that reproduction of copyrighted material was protected by fair dealing. The recent advent of widely available generative artificial intelligence tools such as ChatGPT and Google Bard 
raises some important and serious copyright issues. Uh, one, one big question is, you know, is AI-generated work protected by copyright? And a related question would be, who is considered to be the author of an AI-generated work? Would it be the AI itself, or would it be the company or the, the, the people who developed the AI? Or would it be the human user who asked the AI a question or asked it to do something? So those are, those are open questions. But what we do know is that under the current Copyright Act, copyright owners can only be human beings. So that precludes an AI from owning a copyright. So if the author of a work is an AI, that work cannot be subject to copyright and therefore uh, is in the public domain. As I mentioned earlier, these the, the questions that are raised here are open questions that you know we don't have any definitive answers to, at least not yet. Uh, but I think we'll need to distinguish between works that are primarily created by an AI versus works created primarily by humans with the help of AI. Uh, 